Our sermon text is from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 52. Awake, awake, O Zion, clothe yourself with strength. Put on your garments of splendor, O Jerusalem, the holy city. The uncircumcised and defiled will not enter you again. Shake off your dust, rise up, sit enthroned, O Jerusalem. Free yourself from the chains on your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For this is what the Lord says. You were sold for nothing, and without money you will be redeemed. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says. At first, my people went down to Egypt to live. Lately, Assyria has oppressed them. And now, what do I have here, declares the Lord? For my people have been taken away for nothing, and those who rule them mock, declares the Lord. All day long, my name is constantly blasphemed. Therefore, my people will know my name. Therefore, in that day, they will know that it is I who foretold it. Yes, it is I. This is the word of our Lord. My dear friends in Christ, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, the great tales of these great empires from the ancient world fill the, the pages and pages of history books. But in these history books on, ancient, on the ancient civilizations, you'll rarely find more than a page or two at most devoted to the kingdom of Israel. And that's because from an earthly point of view, Israel really never amounted to that much. Now, yes, they had some power when King David and King Solomon ruled over them, but by and large, for most of its history, Israel was just a, a powerless pawn in the hands of those mighty ancient empires. And that's something that Isaiah mentions in our text. Speaking on behalf of the Lord, Isaiah says to the Jews, You were sold for nothing. At first, my people went down to Egypt to live. Lately, Assyria has oppressed them. For my people have been taken away for nothing. And those who rule them mock. As, as most of us know, Israel toiled under Egyptian slavery for hundreds of years. But then Israel got its freedom. Israel became its own nation. But then after a long time, that nation of Israel split into two countries. The ten tribes in the north, called Israel, and Judah in the south, its own country, Judah. Now about 722 B.C., this new kingdom of Assyria rose up and they attacked the northern kingdom of Israel and they actually destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel in 722 B.C. About 20 years later, around 700 B.C., during the time of Isaiah the prophet's ministry, the Assyrians also attacked and soundly defeated the armies of that southern kingdom of Judah. But the Assyrian army stopped short of actually attacking the city of Jerusalem. Now, Isaiah again mentions all of this. He describes it by saying that God's people were sold for nothing and have been taken away for nothing. Now, in other words, Israel and Judah, they belonged to the Lord. They were the Lord's own people. But Egypt and Assyria took away the Lord's possession without giving the Lord anything. They, they stole God's people from God. And to make matters worse, these heathen empires ridiculed the religion of Israel and Judah. That's why Isaiah says, those empires who rule God's people mock the Lord. But the Lord will not tolerate mockery against him. And the Lord will not tolerate heathen empires stealing his possessions. But more than that, much, much more than that, God will not tolerate his own people ignoring him doubting him and disobeying him. But that's exactly what the Jews during Isaiah's, during Isaiah's time were doing. They were worshiping pagan idols instead of worshiping the one true God. They were, they were trusting foreign alliances with, with those pagan empires for their peace and security rather than trusting in God for their peace and security. And they were imitating the immorality of the pagans instead of instead of obeying God's 
God's commandments. Doubting God, ignoring God, disobeying God. This is why the Lord allowed those pagan heathen empires to attack his people and eventually overcome and conquer his people. Now today in the year 2020, God's people are you and me, all believers in Jesus Christ. We are God's people. And today, the church, believers, face some of the same things, similar things that that the ancient Jews experienced. There are evil empires out there to get us. The evil empire of Satan is stealing away God's possession. The evil empire of Satan is, is stealing more and more people away from the true Christian faith, out of the Christian church. The evil empire of this sinful world is ridiculing and mocking Christian faith, Christian doctrine, the Holy Scriptures, and Christian morals and ethics. But worse than that, worse than all of that, is that you and I, God's people today, we are imitating the ancient Jews during the time of Isaiah. We worship false idols. We worship the idols of our money, our leisure time, our political rights, more than we worship, more than we love our God. And we curse and swear more than we used to do because we, we are just giving ourselves in to the immorality of this wicked world around us. We cheat, we lie, we insult and belittle God's authorities in, in our home, in our church, and especially in our government. And yes, we trust We trust our own bank accounts. We trust our our own retirement plans. We trust our own abilities, our own cleverness, more than we trust in the Lord to take care of us and watch over us and protect us and provide for us. Now, for all of those sins of ignoring the Lord, doubting the Lord, disobeying the Lord, for all of our sins, we deserve to have the Lord destroy us. The Lord has every right to cut us off from his grace. The Lord has every right to let those empires of Satan and sin and death completely consume us. But as God did for his Old Testament people, the Jews, so God still does for you and me today. God loves us. God cares for us. God provides for us. God protects us. God has promised to be our God. And God never goes back on his promises. God never goes back on his word. Now getting back to the ancient Jews, God promised them, I will treasure you as my people. And even though when you sin, I will send these evil empires against you to punish you, to conquer you, to to destroy you. Well, after all that's over, I will I will pick you back up again. I will restore you and renew you and make you my own again. Now, in our text, Isaiah proclaims one of those promises of restoration that the Lord gave to his Old Testament people, the Jews. Speaking again on behalf of the Lord, Isaiah says to the Jews, Awake, awake, O Zion, clothe yourself with strength, put on your garments of splendor, O Jerusalem, the holy city. Shake off your dust, rise up, sit enthroned, O Jerusalem, free yourself from the chains on your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. Basically, the Lord was telling his people, be the people I have made you to be. Believe in me as your God and as your Savior. Trust my love for you. And then you will live in purity. Then you will live in prosperity. Then you will live in protection. Then you will live in the splendor of my glory. Then you will be free from your enemies. And then you will never be captives of anyone ever again. Now, again, those are some mighty promises that God made to his people, the Jews. Unfortunately, though, and it was very easy for them to do, unfortunately, the Jews missed the point of all those promises. They thought that that by using those words that God was using, they thought that God was promising them military might and political power. But we know that's not what God was promising them. All we have to do is look at the rest of the Old Testament. Really, all we have to do is study ancient history. And we know what happened to the Jews. After the Assyrian Empire fell, the Jews weren't free. But the Babylonian Empire took its place quickly, and, and actually it was the Babylonians who destroyed Jerusalem in 586 B.C. And that Babylonian Empire, well, it fell pretty quickly to the Persians. And the Persians came. And even though they were nicer to the Jews, they still ruled over 
Judah, and the Holy Land. Well, the Persian Empire also quickly fell to Alexander the Great and his conquering Greek armies, and then the Holy Land, Judah, fell under Greek control. And then, a few years later, a few decades later, the Romans controlled the Holy Land. So, God's people were never really free. There were a few years when Israel was a little bit independent, but during that time, from Isaiah to the birth of Christ, the Israelites, the Jews, they never really possessed any real, real political power. And, you know, something similar is, is, is very true to this day. God never intended his church to have political power. Now, I know there are some students of history out there who might say, well, during the Middle Ages, the outward organization of the church, they, they were the most powerful institution in Europe for almost a thousand years. They certainly, the church certainly had power then. And that's true. And it's also true in America today that any politician who wants to get elected has to appeal to the Christian vote, has to say something that the Christians like so that he will not irritate them, that he will gain them over so he can win election. But the purpose of the church, the God-given purpose of the church, is never to practice political sway and influence. The glory of the church is not wealth, influence, and power. No, the glory of the church is God's grace. The glory of the church is the forgiveness of sins, purchased and won by the holy, precious blood of Jesus Christ, our Savior. The glory of the church is that God blessed us with status, the status of being his chosen people. And the glory of the church is for us to imitate Christ in serving other people with humble acts of kindness and love and charity. And the glory of the church is that good news that by God's grace alone, through the Holy Spirit's gift of faith in Christ alone, we are looking forward to a kingdom not of this world. We are awaiting a heavenly, glorious, splendorous kingdom forever and ever. But as we wait in this world, as we wait in, in lowliness and in humility and often in oppression, we have hope. We have joy because we know that we have the victory over our worst enemies. And we know who those enemies are. Those, those enemies are all, all so familiar. Those enemies constantly attack our faith and our well-being. Those enemies of the church, they, they, they mock our, our, our faith. They make our life miserable. Those enemies of the church, of course, are the devil, the sinful world, and our own sinful flesh. But again, no matter how hard these enemies pound us down and push us around, we still have the victory over them. We have the victory over sin, death, and Satan because we share in Christ's victory. And Christ conquered our spiritual enemies, our everlasting enemies. Christ conquered those enemies by his life, his death, and his resurrection. And so now we, today, God's people, can do what Isaiah told the Jews 700 years before the birth of Christ, what Isaiah told the Jews to do. He said, Awake, awake, O Zion, clothe yourself with strength. Put on your garments of splendor, O Jerusalem, the holy city. Shake off your dust, rise up, sit enthroned, O Jerusalem. Free yourself from the chains, O captive daughter of Zion. Yes, you are the holy city. You are Zion. You are the daughters and the sons of God in Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem. You are God's people. So do what Isaiah says. Wake up to reality. You have the victory over sin, death, and hell. You have the victory over the devil and his demons and the debauchery of this world. So live in that victory. Put on your garments of splendor. That is, cover yourself with the robe of righteousness. That is Christ's holy life. That holy life of Christ defends you against Satan's accusations, against the temptations of this world. That holy life of Christ covers all of your sins. And yes, you, God's people, rise up and sit enthroned. Yes, sit on 
the royal throne of God because God has made you a royal priesthood to rule over all creation with Christ and all his angels. You are nobody's slaves. Nobody can hold you captive. And there is something about your rule with Christ that no other empire has ever had the ability to lay claim to. Your rule with Christ will last forever. I mean, think about it. After all, Egypt, the pharaohs of Egypt, they are lying buried in pyramids along the Nile. The glories and the, and the civilization of the, of the Babylonians and the Assyrians and the Persians, all those glories, all those now ruins lie underneath the sand in Turkey and Iraq and Iran. Alexander the Great's empire split up after his death and quickly disintegrated almost as quickly as it rose to power. And all those Roman emperors, all those great Caesars, well, they now stand as lifeless statues in European museums. But one ancient kingdom still exists, and it has existed since the beginning of time. One kingdom has stood the test of time, and one kingdom still has its citizens spread all over the world. One kingdom will rule forever and ever. And this kingdom is the Holy Christian Church. This kingdom is the rule of Jesus Christ. This kingdom, this is the new Jerusalem whose streets are paved with gold. And so the golden rule, that is, those who live in the kingdom of Christ, in the kingdom of heaven, where the streets are paved with gold, they will rule over all creation with Christ their king. And their rule, that is actually our rule, our, our rule, our victory, our triumph over sin and, and devil and death, our golden rule will last forever and ever. And it'll never fade away because Isaiah tells us the uncircumcised, that is the people who are not God's people, the uncircumcised and the defiled, the wicked, they will not enter this kingdom. That is, no evil, no sin, no death, no doubts, no unbelief will ever walk those golden streets of heaven. No, we will live forever in this new golden Jerusalem. And we will live there as saints, as holy ones, and we will live there as triumphant ones, those who have conquered our enemies once and for all. Yes, in the new Jerusalem of heaven, the golden rule. And we who are dressed in robes of splendor, garments of splendor, we will rule with Christ our King forever and ever. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.